Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders faced off one-on-one -on -one in the 11th Democratic debate hosted by CNN and Univision in Washington, D.C. So, who won the debate? This is a rather ambiguous question given the place we now find ourselves in the Democratic primary race for the 2020 election. Typically, I've distinguished winners and losers based on this question, who improved their odds? But as I'll discuss in this video, that question is somewhat insufficient to create a substantive breakdown of this debate. After all, at this point in the race, the goals of both Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders ought to have evolved beyond simply winning the Democratic primary. So I'll also address this question. Who did what they needed to do? Finally, I'll evaluate the relative performances of both candidates outside of the context of the primary race to address this more basic question. Who had a better debate performance? After all, winning or losing a debate can mean different things depending on how exactly you answer this question. What does winning look like? Thanks first and foremost goes out to all the patrons who keep this work alive. Big shout out to my newest supporters, William Foster, She Brings the Rain, Justin Barris, Dogboat333, Matt Wong, Ishmael Wadi, Ethan, Colgen Namath, James Noonan, Giovanni Hernandez, Bad Art Collective SD, Eli Dewinink, Comic 616, Charlotte Townsend, Mike LeBlanc, Trey Sullivan, Logan Belknap, Ethan Griffith, Jacob Kite, Nate Maddox, Pensagi, Logan Goodnature, Lord Jackson, John Paul, Sean Loney, Willem Bowman, Butta Batty, Benden, and Kendall Lowe. All of you guys signed up within just the last three weeks. I've picked up a lot of new patrons recently, so thank you so much. These videos do get demonetized fairly regularly, so the patronage really makes a difference. Every now and then on Patreon, I do try to get up early releases and a little additional content. But really the only rewards I give to patrons is the occasional shout out and the ability to message me directly. But bottom line, the more support I get on Patreon, the more time I'm able to dedicate to making these videos. So I really do appreciate the support. It means the world to me. If you're thinking about joining these everyday heroes, you can head on over to patreon.com slash question time. Anyway, let's talk about who won the 11th Democratic debate, focusing first on the question, who improved their odds? As I spoke about in my predictions video, a win, as I've defined it for previous debate breakdown videos, would be extremely difficult for Bernie to secure in this debate. Generally speaking, I've considered it to be a win when a candidate improves the likeliness of their campaign success. In various debates, relatively obscure candidates like Amy Klobuchar, Andrew Yang, and Tulsi Gabbard delivered performances that I thought might push their campaigns into mid-level contention. Mid-level contenders like Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, and Pete Buttigieg in various debates gave performances that I thought might push them into top-tier contention. Well, with just two serious candidates left, there are no tiers anymore. The race is Biden versus Bernie. So we must reform the question about winning to be something like, did their performance make a primary victory look more plausible? But even that is a rather difficult threshold for Bernie to pass. At the time of this recording, Biden leads the race with 1,180 delegates to Bernie Sanders' 885. According to RCP, Biden has 56% of Democratic voters supporting him to Sanders 35. 538 gives Biden more than a 99% chance of securing the nomination. Given all this, it would seem strange to say that Bernie won the debate by improving his odds from 0.1% to 1.1%, or dropping Biden's from 99 to 98%. In the context of the full race, Biden's already essentially locked it down. To secure a win in this debate when it comes to actually becoming a plausible contender for winning the Democratic primary race, there really was nothing Sanders could do. Sanders could only win on this measure if Biden did something to severely damage his own campaign. So victory or defeat hinged entirely on whether Biden embarrassed himself so utterly, so dramatically, that it would have the potential to destroy his campaign. That very clearly did not happen. Biden didn't pledge allegiance to Vladimir Putin. He didn't accidentally announce that he has a disqualifying medical condition. He didn't froth at the mouth and yell bigoted things, which by the way is not disqualifying in a Republican primary. He didn't physically assault Bernie Sanders or the moderators. He didn't say that his first act as president would be to suspend the constitution. You get the idea. 
Winning in terms of seriously improving his campaign's vitality was essentially a shoe in for Biden and next to impossible for Bernie Sanders. It didn't happen. Biden is still overwhelmingly likely to be the next Democratic nominee. I know it's annoying for Sanders supporters to hear this. I know you were angry when I said that this was the case in my predictions video, but it just happens to be the truth. I wish it wasn't. I prefer Bernie. If your state hasn't voted yet and you want to vote for Bernie, by all means do so. But we're not likely to see him become the nominee and this debate didn't change that. Of course, this shallow level of analysis is not itself enough to count as a breakdown of this debate. To know that Biden's still winning by very strong odds, we wouldn't even have to watch the debate. We'd just have to scan the headlines to confirm that at no point did Biden tear his shirt off and begin making ape noises, a la Alex Jones. I'm the weirdo because I'm sitting in the tree going... <laughs> Winning the Democratic nomination is also a rather trivial goal for Biden's campaign at this point. It's also an implausible target for Bernie to hit. Now that Biden's lead is so close to insurmountable, both campaigns ought to be looking at the next stage of the 2020 election, and each have their own separate targets to hit regarding that. This brings us to our next question. Who did what they needed to do? When it comes to this question, it's not a one or the other situation. While it is impossible for both Bernie and Biden to improve their odds of winning the Democratic primary, their goals for the next phase could be met by both candidates at the same time or not met by either, or met by one but not the other. I spoke about what these goals ought to be for each candidate, again in my predictions video for this debate, but I'll reiterate them briefly here. For Biden, the goal is uniting the Democratic Party. It doesn't do him any good to win the Democratic nomination, only to lose the general election to Donald Trump. While he secured above 50% of Democratic support in the primary race, that's simply not enough to beat Trump. To do that, he needs to unite the party. He needs to assure Sanders supporters that he'll look out for them, not just his more moderate backers, and he needs to win them over without losing the support of his current constituency. So let me say, especially to the young voters who have been inspired by Senator Sanders, I hear you. I know what's at stake. I know what we have to do. Our goal as a campaign, and my goal as a candidate for president, is to unify this party, and then to unify the nation. For Sanders, the goal is to secure concessions, move Biden to accept more progressive policy, get him to promise cabinet positions to progressive politicians. Basically, on accomplishing these goals, Bernie secured a win if Biden looks like he's shifting towards the left. Biden secured a win if it looks like the left will shift toward him. Conveniently, both of these things begin to be addressed in a section of the debate in which Biden is asked about policies he's recently adopted. Vice President Biden, yesterday you endorsed an Elizabeth Warren plan that would undo key parts of the bankruptcy law you helped pass in 2005. A few hours ago, you announced support for making public college tuition free for families who make less than $125,000 a year, something Senator Sanders has supported. What changed? Indeed, both of these things indicate a leftward shift for Joe Biden, and both represent Biden's effort to win over the progressive wing of the party. Notably, of course, when it comes to tuition-free college, Biden's position is still not as far to the left as Bernie's. As a statement from Sanders' campaign argues, it's great that Joe Biden is now supporting a position that was in the Democratic platform four years ago. Now we have to go much further. We need to make all public universities, colleges, and trade schools tuition-free for everyone like our high schools are. We need to cancel all student debt, and we can fund it with a small tax on Wall Street speculation. Two things. Number one, let's talk about the bankruptcy bill. The bankruptcy bill was passing overwhelmingly, and I improved it. I had a choice. It was going to pass to the Republican president, Republican Congress, and I offered two amendments to make sure that people under $50,000 would not be affected and women and children would go to the front of the line on alimony and support payments. I did not like the bill. I did not support the bill. And I made it clear to the industry I didn't like the bill. Biden's characterization of his previous non-support for the bankruptcy bill is a little deceptive. ABC News describes the bill as something that he and Warren famously sparred over in the past. CNN confirms this and described Biden as a leading advocate of the bill. According to The Intercept, Biden pushed for years to ram the bill through, voting for some version of it at least four times between 1998 and 2005. 
often against the majority of Democrats, and even inserting its language into a 2000 foreign relations bill. And Biden did the opposite of what he claims on the amendments. The record makes clear that as Senator Biden used his clout to push for the law's passage and to defeat amendments to shield service members, women, and children from its harsh treatment. Adam Levitin, a bankruptcy law professor at Georgetown Law, wrote in January, When votes were taken, middle class Joe was no friend to the middle class. When Sanders got a chance, he mentioned something that the moderators had not, that Biden did more than help pass a bankruptcy bill. Joe, if my memory is correct, you helped write that bankruptcy bill, Sanders said. But Biden retorted, I did not. Biden had, in fact, helped draft a 2000 version of the bill that was pocket vetoed by President Bill Clinton. Now, all of this is to say more than just that Biden is being a little shady about his record. The fact is he supported this law in the past and is shifting to the left in undoing it. In particular, he's shifting toward Bernie's position as well. As Bernie noted during the debate, You said, Joe, that a majority of the people in the Senate voted for it. You're right. Overwhelmingly, Joe. Overwhelmingly. Well, I voted against it in the House, and I was right. This encapsulates much of Bernie's response to Biden's recent leftward shifts. Biden is now coming around on the issues, but for Bernie, leadership is about supporting the right thing before it's popular. And I'm glad that Joe is on board, but what leadership is about is going forward when it's not popular, when it's an idea that you get criticized for. So I'm proud of that fact, and I'm proud of my leadership on many issues. Joe, since the campaign, has come around. I talked about raising that minimum wage 15 bucks an hour four years ago, Joe. So did I, and I went out and paid for $15 an hour? $15 an hour, All New right. York City. Go talk to the governor. I will talk I to the governor. There. I'm not aware of that. All right. I am not aware well, of that. You should be aware. Look, Biden is essentially correct on this. He wasn't necessarily supporting a $15 federal minimum wage, which was Sanders' position, but he did support a $15 minimum wage in the state of New York as far back as September of 2015 is actually much more than four years ago. You remember the Defense of America. It was, you know, gay marriage today is considered a little bit differently than it was 25 years ago. I remember that vote. It was a very hard vote. I voted against the Defense of Marriage Act. You voted for it. I voted against the bankruptcy bill. You voted for it. I voted against the war in Iraq, which was also a tough vote. You voted for it. I voted against disastrous trade agreements like NAFTA and PNTR with China, which cost this country over 4 million good paying jobs. You voted for it. I voted against the Hyde Amendment, which denies low income women the right to get an abortion. You have consistently voted for it. I don't know what your position is on it today, but you have consistently voted for it. In other words, all that I'm saying here, we can argue about the merits of the bill. Vice President Biden. It takes courage sometimes to vote, do the right thing. Now, fortunately for our discussion here, Biden was then directly asked by Jake Tapper how he plans on winning over Sanders supporters if he secures the Democratic nomination. How will you appeal to supporters of Senator Sanders when you do disagree on so many issues. Biden's dejected response to this is pretty funny. He's making it hard for me right now. I was trying to give him credit for some things. He won't even (laughs) take the credit for things he wants to do. That is pretty much what we're witnessing. Biden is offering a couple of small concessions to the left, and Bernie's not exactly welcoming him with open arms. Considering just how much Bernie was able to get Clinton and the Democratic Party to shift to the left in 2016, it's not surprising that two token policy shifts isn't enough for Sanders this time around. It's probably the right strategy for Bernie to push for more at this point. I'm surprised Biden is surprised that this isn't enough. Anyway, Biden's response continues here. Look, uh, I think that I want to make it clear. If Bernie's a nominee, I will not only support him, I will campaign for him. And I believe the people who support me will do the same thing. Because the existential threat to the United States of America is Donald Trump. Two critical errors Biden makes here. First saying that he'll support Bernie if he wins now is too little too late. He should have made that clear when Bernie was in the lead. When Bernie was winning, Biden didn't even say that the candidate with the most pledged delegates should win the convention. So it's pretty hard for him to win over Bernie supporters by saying now that Bernie's losing, I'll support him if he wins. By the way, of course, Bernie also pledged during this debate that he'd support Joe if he wins, but he already made that pledge before Joe even entered the race by promising to support whoever the Democratic nominee happens to be. The other critical error for Biden here is saying that Donald Trump Trump is the big threat to the United States. Look, I don't like Trump. I want him to lose the general election. I think all Democrats and progressive independents feel the same way. But when you describe Trump as the big threat, it undermines all the other problems facing America. 
As Andrew Yang often pointed out during this election, Trump is a symptom, not the cause of all our problems. Arguing that Trump is the essential threat makes Biden's campaign look like a campaign to go back to normal, which is not going to be effective for winning over progressives, populists, young people. And Biden actually repeated this theme multiple times throughout the debate, indicating that he and Bernie fundamentally agreed because they both wanted to get rid of Trump, an idea Sanders firmly rejected. Senator Sanders and I both agree we need health care should be a right, not a privilege. We both agree we have to give deal with student debt. We both agree we have to deal with education and access to education. We both agree that we deal that we have a new green deal to deal with the existential threat that faces humanity. We disagree on the detail of how we do it but we don't disagree on the principle. It's just not true. Biden's version of the public option is one of the more conservative out there. It doesn't even automatically enroll people who lose their private health care. Bernie's Medicare for All plan is a substantially progressive single-payer health care system, one that even covers things like prescription medication, dental, and eyeglasses, all things not even covered by Canada's health care system. In terms of the environment, Biden's Green New Deal is the same as the version Bernie supports in name only. Senate Resolution 59 calls for the U.S. to hit net zero emissions in 10 years, a full two decades before the special report on climate change of 2018 claims the entire world must be at that level. In other words, the Green New Deal that Bernie supports means leading the world in terms of hitting emissions targets. Biden calls for the U.S. to reach net zero emissions by 2050. Thus, his goal is for the country to meet the bare minimum target just in time to join the rest of the world, should it continue to exist at that time. So yeah, their policies are different. As Bernie pointed out, But details make a difference. Bernie and Biden actually clashed extensively on climate change, with Bernie insisting that Biden's plans did not go far enough, and Biden essentially arguing that there's no big difference to be seen. Uh, we are talking about the absolute need, and I want to hear Joe's position on this. This is not a middle-of-the-ground thing. This is not building a few more solar panels or a few more wind turbines. What this is about is transforming our energy system as quickly as we humanly can away from fossil fuel. It is insane that we continue to have fracking in America. It is absurd that we give tens of billions of dollars a year in tax breaks and subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. This has got to end and end now if we love our kids and future generations. The price tag for your climate plan is about $1.7 trillion. That's about $14 trillion less than Senator Sanders wants to spend on this. Is your plan ambitious enough to tackle this crisis? Yes, it is ambitious enough to tackle the, crack, the, the crisis because what you go to JoeBiden.com, I lay out the first 13 things I would do immediately upon being elected. I would immediately rejoin the Paris Climate Accord, which I helped put together. I would call the 100 nations, over 100 nations, but the 100 major polluters to the United States in the first 100 days to up the ante. And make it clear that in fact we would in fact if they didn't there'd be a price to pay and lastly i would be right now organizing the hemisphere and the world to provide 20 billion dollars for the amazon for brazil no mm. longer to burn the amazon so they could have forest they're no, no longer forest but they could have farming Sanders. all well and good but nowhere near enough i mean you mentioned we started this debate talking about a warlike situation in terms of the coronavirus. And we said we have to act accordingly. You said it, I think you're right, I said it. We have to act dramatically, boldly, if we're gonna save lives in this country and around the world. I look at climate change in exactly the same way. It's not a question of re-entering the Paris of court. That's fine, who cares? Not a big deal. What Joe was saying goes nowhere near enough. It's not a question of money. Let me give me a minute here. Let's, we have time to talk about this. No more subsidies for fossil fuel industry. No more drilling on federal lands. No more drilling, including offshore. No ability for the oil industry to continue to drill, period. Ends. Number one. Biden's plan does not, as he seems to suggest in the debate, give oil companies no more ability to drill. It just stops the issuing of new permits for drilling on public lands and waters places limits on methane pollution for new and existing oil and gas operations, and bans oil companies from operating new drilling sites in the Arctic. Thank okay, you. Look, obviously, the Paris Accord is, is useful, but it doesn't go anywhere. If you're laughing, Joe, then you're missing the point. You're this is an existential crisis. Bingo. You, you, you talk about, you know, I'm talking about stopping fracking as soon as we possibly can. I'm talking about telling the fossil fuel industry that they are going to stop destroying 
this planet. No ifs, buts, and maybes about it. I'm talking about speaking oh to China. Well, I'm not sure your proposal does that. We've got to take on the fossil fuel industry. Your plan does not do that. My plan takes on the fossil fuel industry and it unites the world. He just got finished saying. What's he going to do? He's going to bring these countries together, make it clear to them. I'm saying we bring them together, make them live up to the commitments. If they don't live up to the commitments, they pay a financial price for it. You know, you're talking about making countries around the world fulfill their commitments. Those commitments are not enough. What this moment is about, Joe, is that the scientists are telling us they underestimated the severity of the crisis. They were wrong. The problem is more severe. You cannot continue, as I understand Joe believes, to continue fracking. Correct me if I am wrong. Not wrong. In the extensive climate change plan Biden has on his website, nowhere does the word fracking even appear. At any rate, I think we've seen enough of the debate already to analyze whether Bernie and Biden are hitting their goals. When it comes to Biden, his goal should be to win over Bernie supporters. What he's offered so far are basically these four points. I've changed my mind on that bankruptcy bill, but I was never actually wrong. I'll go half the way on tuition-free public colleges. I agree with Bernie on healthcare and climate change as long as you ignore the details. And most crucially of all, I'm not Donald Trump and that's what really matters. I expect that this is not enough to win over progressives. I'm sure there will be a lot of progressives who will vote to just vote out Donald Trump, but Biden really hasn't done much to welcome them into the fold. Progressives will likely be quite frustrated that he's pretending his policies aren't all that different from Bernie's. And pretending that the few concessions that he has made don't actually represent a change for him is likewise frustrating. In terms of winning over progressives, Biden, I think, failed in his mission. Now, if Bernie's goal was to shift Biden to the left, we really didn't see that happen during this debate either. Sure, Biden came to the table with a couple of small concessions, but at no point was there any sense that Biden would consider accepting one of Bernie's positions. Indeed, in several places, he repeatedly refused to acknowledge that a difference even exists. On climate change, Biden was firm that his plan did enough. On healthcare, the number one issue for Democrats, Biden likewise refused to compromise. Instead, he continued to argue against Medicare for all in this debate. Bernie talks about, excuse me, the senator talks about his Medicare for all. He still hasn't told you how he's gonna ever get it passed. He hasn't told you how, in fact, there's any possibility of that happening. He hadn't told you how much it's gonna cost. He hadn't tell you how it's gonna apply. It doesn't kick in for four years even after it passes. Given that, he's not likely to change his mind on what he said last week to Lawrence O'Donnell, that even if Congress passed a Medicare for all bill as president, he would veto it. Or at least that's what he seemed to say. His campaign has denied this, and his statement was actually kind of complicated. Lawrence O'Donnell asked, let's flash forward, you are president, Bernie Sanders is still active in the Senate. He manages to get Medicare for all through the Senate in some compromised version, the Elizabeth Warren version or other version. Nancy Pelosi gets a version of it through the House of Representatives. It comes to your desk. Do you veto it? Biden responded, I would veto anything that delays providing the security and the certainty of health care being available now. If they got that through by some miracle, and there was an epiphany that occurred, and some miracle occurred, that said, okay, it passed, then you got to look at the costs. I want to know, how do they find the $35 trillion? What is that doing? Is it going to significantly raise taxes on the middle class? Which it will. What's going to happen? It sounds to me like Biden is saying he would veto it, but also that he's having trouble expressing himself clearly. At any rate, from what we've seen so far, it seems clear that Bernie's failed to push Biden into granting concessions to progressives, and Biden's failed to position himself such that the full base of the Democratic Party will be excited enough to go vote for him in the general election. It also seems clear that when it comes to winning the actual arguments and getting facts right, Bernie's overall doing better than Biden, at least so far. This brings us to our next big question about winning this debate. Who had a better debate performance? This is perhaps the cleanest way of evaluating a debate. Who debated better? Whose arguments were more effective, logical, and based on accurate premises? Who had better stage presence? Whose rhetoric was more elegant? who is more persuasive. When it came to the more subtle art of poise and stage presence, both candidates had some issues. While discussing the present pandemic, 
Bernie went on for a rather long time accidentally referring to the virus as Ebola. The Ebola crisis, in my view, exposes the dysfunctionality of our healthcare system and how poorly prepared we are despite how much money that we spend. And the Ebola crisis is also, I think, exposing the cruelty and the unjustness of our economy today. We have more income and wealth inequality in America today than any time in 100 years. And what that means that in the midst of this crisis, you know, if you're a multimillionaire, no one's happy about this crisis. You're gonna get through it. You're gonna get everything you need. You're not worried about healthcare. Half of our people are living paycheck to paycheck. We got people who are struggling working two or three jobs to put food on the table. What is gonna happen to them? So the lesson to be learned is we have got to move aggressively right now to address the economic crisis as a result of Ebola, uh, as a result, keep talking about Ebola, you got Ebola in my head here right now. Biden himself had made multiple references to Ebola and H1N1, although it didn't seem to me like he was mislabeling the current pandemic with those references. At any rate, he began discussing this current pandemic while coughing and speaking in a rather scratchy voice. First of all, my heart goes out to those <clears throat> who have already lost someone or those who are suffering from the virus and uh... dry cough is, of course, a symptom related to this flu like virus. And Biden and Sanders both have combated issues about their advanced age. In terms of projecting youthful vigor, both candidates seem to have come up a little short based on these admittedly trivial problems with their performances. Far more important to a presidential debate is projecting a general level of strength and passion. And at various points in this debate, both candidates, I think, accomplished this well enough. My state is three feet above sea level. I don't need a lecture on what's going to happen about rising seas. I know what happens. I watch the whole Delmarva Peninsula, just like it is in South Carolina and the rest. Something I know a little bit about. I wrote the first climate change bill that was in the Congress, which PolitiFact said was a game changer. I'm the guy who came along and said with Dick Luger that we're going to trade. We'll forgive your debt if you don't cut down your forests. I've been way ahead of this curve. This idea that all of a sudden Bernie found this out is amazing to me. How in God's name does it happen that we end up with 87 million people who are uninsured or underinsured, and there are people who are watching this program tonight who say, I'm not feeling well. Should I go to the doctor, but I can't afford to go to the doctor? What happens if I am sick? It's gonna cost thousands of dollars for treatment. Who's gonna feed my kids? We are the only major country on earth not to guarantee healthcare to all people. We're spending so much money, and yet we are not even prepared for this pandemic? How come we don't have enough doctors? How come hospitals in rural areas are shutting down? How come people can't afford to get the prescription drugs they need because we have a bunch of crooks who are running the pharmaceutical industry, ripping us off every single day? And I'll tell you something right now. In the midst of this epidemic, you got people in the pharmaceutical industry are saying, oh, wow, what an opportunity to make a fortune. Eloquence is also an important quality for a president. And while Biden didn't have any major issues here, as in previous debates, it was clear he fumbled over his words a bit and lost his train of thought every now and then, a problem not exhibited by Sanders. When it comes to basing arguments on false premises, Biden seemed to be more guilty of this than was Sanders. He was generally correct about the $15 minimum wage support, which Sanders said he wasn't sure about, but he also made a number of factual errors when it came to Sanders' record. He claimed that Sanders voted against the auto bailout. Sanders did vote against TARP, which bailed out the banks, and a portion of that money eventually did make its way to automakers. But he also voted for the $14 billion auto rescue plan in December of 2008. Biden continued to claim in this debate that his vote to authorize the use of force in Iraq was a mistake and based purely on the assumption that the measure would just be used to get inspectors in. The implication is that he never actually was in favor of the Iraq war. That's not the case. In a speech in Delaware in 2003, Biden said, let everyone here be absolutely clear. I supported the resolution to go to war. I am not opposed to war to remove weapons of mass destruction from Iraq. I am not opposed to war to remove Saddam from those weapons if it comes to that. Part of Biden's claim of why he was misled is that he trusted George Bush, who according to Biden, made a promise not to go to war. Bush denies ever making such a promise. Biden claimed that Sanders is backed by nine super PACs. While Sanders does have the backing of a number of progressive groups, including nine that are part of the People Power for Bernie coalition, these are not super PACs. Most are political nonprofits. Biden, on the other hand, does enjoy the support of Democratic super PACs. 
There are more things that Biden lied about, but I'll get into those later. For the sake of balance, I tried to dig up some false statements from Bernie in this debate, but it was actually difficult to find clear examples. Sanders claimed that at least 30,000 and up to 60,000 people died due to inadequate health care. This is generally supported by a study in the Lancet Medical Journal, but the figure is actually 68,000 according to that study. Other experts have cast doubts on those figures though, as the study relied on some data from a paper from 2009 before the ACA came into existence, which would have changed those figures. The fact check from the New York Times also argues that Sanders inflated the degree to which he and former President Barack Obama were united in opposition to an immigration bill in 2000. While both did vote, as Sanders claimed, against the bill, Obama also voted to end the debate and take a final vote on the whole bill three times, while on that procedural vote around the bill, Sanders voted in the opposite direction. That same fact check also claimed that Sanders' point about Biden's multiple attempts to cut Social Security was true but lacks context. The New York Times pointed out that while Biden did praise and vote for several measures that would cut Social Security, he has also vowed to protect the program at other times, including in the Senate in a 2012 vice presidential debate and in his current campaign where he has proposed expanding the program. Not to get off too into a tangent here, but as The Intercept points out, Bernie's characterization of Biden's fight against Social Security does appear to have some serious validity. In 1984, though, Biden co-sponsored an amendment to freeze military and domestic spending for a year, which included some built-in adjustments for Social Security benefits, tantamount to cutting the program. In a 1995 speech, Biden was more explicit. He bragged about advocating for cuts to Social Security. I'm up for re-election this year, and I'm going to remind everybody what I did at home which is gonna cost me politically, Biden said, removing his glasses. When I argued if we should freeze federal spending, I meant Social Security as well. I meant Medicare and Medicaid. I meant Veterans Bennett. I meant every single solitary thing in the government. And I not only tried it once, I tried it twice, I tried it a third time, and I tried it a fourth time. As vice president, Biden worked to help negotiate the Bull Simpsons Commission's balanced budget efforts. After it disbanded, Biden brought on its director, Bruce Reed, as his chief of staff. And the next Obama-era push for a balanced budget, including Social Security cuts, was even known as the Biden Committee. Reed is now a senior policy advisor with Biden's presidential campaign. Again, there's no denial by the New York Times that Biden did several times promote the idea of cutting Social Security. They just point out that he's also argued for the exact opposite. I don't think that actually undercuts Sanders' claim that Biden repeatedly boasted about pushing for cuts to the program. On balance, when you look at the fact checking, it's pretty clear that Biden was considerably less honest than was Sanders during this debate. And that's got to count against him. Most important of all is perhaps the quality of the arguments presented. Now, we could go through every second of this debate to break this down, but that seems like an overly exhaustive exercise. So instead, let's highlight a few representative disputes of note. One fairly even exchange, I think, between Biden and Bernie was over the idea of a political revolution. Biden made his case for smaller change rather effectively. We have problems we have to solve now. Now, what's a revolution going to do? Disrupt everything in the meantime? We want a revolution, let's act now. Pass the Biden health care plan, which takes Obamacare, restores all the cuts made to it, subsidizes it further. We can do that now. I can get that passed. I can get that done am I, if I'm president of the United States of America. That will be a fundamental change and it happens now. I can tell you from experience being a significant consumer of healthcare with my sons, my family, all the things we've gone through. What people want is hope and they need it now, not four years from now. But Bernie too made a strong case on this subject, arguing that broader changes are needed to deal with a widely corrupt political system. Why is it that over the last 45 years, despite the huge increase in productivity and technology, the average worker today is not making a nickel more in real dollars? Why is it that over the last 30 years, the richest 1% have seen a $21 trillion increase in their wealth, bottom half of America, $900 billion decline in their wealth? 
And it comes down to something, Jake, we don't talk about. The power structure in America. Who has the power? And I'll tell you who has the power. It's the people who contribute money, the billionaires who contribute money to political campaigns. Those people have the power. And if you want to make real changes in this country, if you want to create an economy that works for all, not just the few, you know what you need? You need to take on Wall Street. You need to take on the drug companies and the insurance companies and the fossil fuel industry. You don't take campaign contributions from them. You take them on and create an economy that works for all. Biden makes a strong point in response here, touting his own past support for campaign finance reform. You want to do that? Do what I proposed over 30 years ago. Federally fund all elections. No private contributions in the election process. If you want to do that, join me. Join me in my constitutional amendment that I've been proposing. Biden's not making this up. He's fought for public funding of elections since the early days of his political career. Back in 1974, just two years after he was first elected to the Senate, Biden told the Washingtonian, I've ended up spending over $300,000 to get elected. I believe that public financing of federal election campaigns is the only thing that will ensure good candidates and save the two-party system. It is the most degrading thing in the world to go out with your hat in your hand and beg for money. But that's what you have to do if you haven't got your own resources. Biden also continued the fight, decades later teaming up with John Kerry and Bill Bradley to attempt to create a system of public funding for congressional candidates. And in 1997, he was a co-sponsor of the Clean Money, Clean Elections Act. Still, Bernie was fairly effective in rebuffing Biden's history on this, pointing to the hypocrisy of his using super PACs now. It's good that you had an idea 30 years ago. I don't want to join you. Why don't you join me? Why don't you get rid of the super PAC that you have right now, which is running very ugly negative ads about me, by the way. <laughs> don't laugh, Joe. That's just the truth. <laughs> and I got two other super PACs running ads against us. Why don't you just say right now, go on television and say, hey, you know what? I think in the past, Joe, if I'm not mistaken, you condemned super PACs. Is that correct? You get rid of the nine super PACs you have? I don't have nine super I don't have you any have super nine. You want me to list them? No, yeah, you go ahead and list okay. them. Okay, come on. Give me a break. As I noted earlier, Biden is indeed using super PACs while Bernie is not. At the same time, Biden was able to undermine Bernie's point about money and politics in terms of this primary race, noting that overall, he had raised less than Bernie and still managed to secure strong wins on Super Tuesday. Bernie, look, in the last... Uh, Super Tuesday and before that. Bernie outspent me two, three, four, five, six to one. And I still won. I didn't have any money. And I still won. Of course, this does ignore the fact that while Biden himself was outspent by Bernie, he also very likely benefited from the spending of candidates like Buttigieg and Klobuchar, who dropped out to endorse Biden just prior to Super Tuesday. It also ignores any advantage Biden might have enjoyed in terms of more favorable coverage in the mainstream media. This whole conversation about political revolution versus improving the system was, in my view, rather balanced, but probably leaned slightly in favor of Joe Biden. Bernie was able to diminish the impact of Biden's long history of supporting campaign finance reform, but that history is real and, in my view, valid. Bernie also had little to say about Biden being able to beat him despite having less money, even though counter arguments are obviously possible. I just pointed out to myself. Similar themes to this conversation occurred earlier in the debate when Bernie and Biden clashed over issues surrounding the pandemic and Medicare for all. While the two largely agreed that Trump was not handling the emergency well and on a number of measures that needed to be urgently taken to deal with the current crisis, they disagreed on the relationship between the crisis and single payer healthcare. Bernie argued that Medicare for all would reduce the damage done by the disease. Biden disagreed. It is not working in Italy right now, and well, they have a single-payer system. Well. This seems to be a bit of a straw man argument. No one is saying that a single-payer system prevents pandemics from occurring. The question is whether having a single-payer system improves a country's ability to deal with one. And Italy's current infection rate is not itself sufficient data to draw a conclusion. Here's how Sanders took on this challenge. First of all, uh, the dysfunctionality of the current healthcare system is obviously apparent. Uh, as I said earlier, there are people who hesitate to go to the doctor. You're gonna have a maze of regulations. Well, if this is my income, if that's my income, can I get it, can I not get it? 
Clearly, we are not prepared, and Trump only exacerbates the crisis. In terms of Medicare for all, despite what the vice president is saying, what the experts tell us is that one of the reasons that we are unprepared and have been unprepared is we don't have a system. We got thousands of private insurance plans. That is not a system that is prepared to provide health care to all people. Sanders is largely correct here. As executive vice president for health policy at the Kaiser Institute, Larry Levitt tweeted, Addressing coronavirus with tens of millions of people without health insurance or with inadequate insurance will be a uniquely American challenge among developed countries. Not having an existing universal system in place, in other words, means that organizing medical relief efforts is inherently more challenging. What's more, having a population that is not used to getting free healthcare could make people more hesitant to seek treatment or testing, even if for the time being those things are provided by the government for free. Biden didn't seem to quite understand these points in his response. That has nothing to do when you're in a national crisis. The national crisis says we're responding. It's all free. You don't have to pay for a thing. That has nothing to do with whether or not you have an insurance policy. This is a crisis. We're at war with the virus. So Bernie's argument is essentially that the system is not used to dealing with a universal issue and people are less likely to seek treatment if they're not used to getting it for free. Biden's response is, in this case, we would provide it for free. That actually misses the point that Bernie is making. And for that reason, on this particular discussion, I think that Bernie's argumentation was superior. Overall, it was a fairly even conversation, but I think this one leans in favor of Sanders. So we need a tiebreaker. Probably the most lopsided dispute of the evening was a continuation of a conversation started in the last debate about Bernie Sanders calling out authoritarianism while at the same time acknowledging accomplishments made by places like Cuba and China. China is undoubtedly an authoritarian society, okay? But would anybody deny, any economists deny, that extreme poverty in China today is much less than what it was 40 or 50 years ago? That's a fact. We condemn authoritarianism, whether it's in China, Russia, Cuba, any place else. But to simply say that nothing ever done by any of those administrations had a positive impact on their people would, I think, be incorrect. Praising of the Sandinistas, the praising of, of Cuba, the praising just now of China. China is an authoritarian dictatorship. That's what it is. We have to deal with them because they're there. But the idea that they, in fact, have increased the wealth of people in that country, it's been marginal, the change that's taken place. Bernie's facial reaction here is absolutely correct. The idea that China's economic growth has been marginal is fairly ridiculous. According to World Bank data in 1990, China's GDP per capita at purchasing power parity was $988. In 2000, that figure had increased to 2,936. In 2018, it was $18,237. In other words, GDP per capita grew in 18 years by more than 18 fold. In the same period, by the same measures, the US grew from just under $24,000 in 1990 to just under $63,000 in 2018. That's a growth of 2.6 times. So China's growth rate was about seven times greater than that of the United States. So Biden was pretty off on this one, and Bernie pressed Biden on the issue. Did China make progress in ending extreme poverty over the last 50 years? That's, yes or no? That's like saying Jack the Ripper. No, it's not. not right. Yes, see, it Joe, is. This is the yes, problem. Yes, it is. This is the, the problem. We can't talk. I know there's a political line. I understand. China's terrible, awful, nothing ever good. Blah, 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 blah. But the fact of the matter is China, of course, is an authoritarian society. That's what I just said. It's a dictatorship. But that's what I just said five minutes ago, you know? I feel Bernie's frustration here. He's being attacked for pointing out clear, demonstrable facts. In my view, this is the problem with political correctness in America today. The old right-wingers sometimes complain about not being able to call Asians Oriental anymore or having to refer to trans people by their preferred pronouns. But you want to see political correctness run amok? I think that that's when someone faces backlash for pointing to accurate information. At any rate, Here's Biden attempting to square the fact that Bernie and Obama had essentially the same things to say about Cuba and villainize Bernie for making accurate points about Cuba and China. The idea of occasionally saying something nice about a country is one thing. The idea of praising a country that is violating human rights around the world is in fact makes our allies wonder what's going on. I would say that's a distinction without a difference, but in fact, it's a distinction 
without a distinction. Saying something nice means exactly the same thing as praising. Throughout this entire discussion, Biden repeatedly points to China and Cuba and the Soviet Union, calling them dictatorships or authoritarian regimes, as if he differs on these things with Bernie. But Bernie agrees with those characterizations. He says so repeatedly, unprompted. Again, a distinction without a distinction. While this exchange may or may not benefit Biden politically, probably helped in Florida, as far as presenting good arguments goes, it's an utter failure, a disheartening one at that. Overall, when it comes to debate performance itself, I think Bernie had a measurable upper hand. He made fewer factual errors, and his arguments were, on balance, more effective. Of course, that doesn't change the fact that this debate happens within a context of an election. When it comes to the Democratic primary race, even though Bernie may have argued better and lied less, nothing about his performance can change the dire circumstances that his campaign is currently in. Biden was winning before this debate, and he continues to lead after it. But of course, the primary race also has a context. It seems clear to me that Biden needs to go beyond eking out a win in the Democratic primary race if he expects to beat Trump in November. He needs to prove that he is strong enough to take on Trump, and he needs to unify the Democratic Party, inspire all Democrats, including young people, Latinos, and progressives, to vote for him. I don't think he accomplished that in this debate. Biden needs to go beyond criticizing Trump and progressives, and give Americans something to vote for, not just something to vote against. In a word, he needs to find a way to make the Democratic Party and himself the answer to this question, what does winning look like?